Act One of Daniel Drews, Blacksmith, by W. S. Gilbert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An incident in the first act was suggested by George Eliot's novel Silas Marner. Characters Sir Jasper Coombe, a royalist colonel. Read by Andrew James. Daniel Drews. Read by Adrian Stevens. Reuben Haynes, a royalist sergeant. Read by Alan Mapstone. Geoffrey Winyard, a merchant sailor. Read by Thomas Peter. Marble. Read by Todd. Joe Ripley, a fisherman. Read by Son of the Exiles. Sergeant of the Parliamentary Army, read by Larry Wilson. Soldier of the Parliamentary Army, read by David Purdy. Dorothy, read by Jen Broda. Stage directions, read by Sonia. The first act is supposed to take place shortly after the Battle of Worcester, an interval of fourteen years between the first and second acts. Act one, a ruined hut on the Norfolk coast. Act two, Daniel Drews's Forge. Act Three: Interior of Drews's Cottage. Daniel Drews, Blacksmith. Act One. Scene: Interior of Daniel Drews's hut, a tumble-down old shanty of the rudest description, with very small wood fire. The whole place is as squalid and miserable as possible. Wind and snow without. Rain and wind heard each time door is opened. Night. Ripley without. Hello, Daniel. Art within. Knox. Daniel, I say, open, will ye? He kicks the door open. Why, the yacht's empty. Where's the old devil gone, I wonder? Come in, master, out of the storm. Enter Marple. Don't be afeard. Marple shuts door. He'll be a bit rusty, to be sure, and are coming in without leave, but I'll blow off sooner than the gale outside. Is the man away? Nay, he's never an hundred yards from this. He's all on up his boat on the beach, maybe, or taking in his nets and making all snug and taut for the night. And well he may, for the devil's let loose, and there'll be mischief afore morning. The devil likes these ere no folk coasts burn him. And so, Jonas lives here? Jonas? No, Daniel. Daniel Drews. Well, Daniel Drews, if that's what he calls himself. It's a strange hole for a man, is he? It's a fit hole for such a dog as he, a surly, scowling, drunken, moisily, half-starved cur. Never was a sulky hound so far athwart the world's ways as Daniel Druce. Why, he's as rich as a Jew and never give bit nor sup to a soul in the town. We take my word for it, it's a fit hole for such as he. Here's only one fitter, and I wish he was in it. Stop that cursed red rag of yours, will you? Come, come, civil words, master, civil words. Set the example. I am this man's brother. Ripley aside. Well, you've got the family tongue in your head anyhow. If you're his brother, maybe you know how we come to live here all alone. Maybe I do. They say that before he came here, a um, matter three or four years since, he was a decent sort of body enough. A blacksmith I do here, but he got struck off silly like through some bad luck, and he's been a changed man ever since. Oh, they say that, do they? 
Well, I don't know what he was, but I know what he is. That's enough for me. The scowlinest, black browedest three corneredest chap I ever see, except as regards children, and he's as fond of children as a young girl, and the littler they are, the more he likes em, and they likes him. Now I'm as tender hearted as a kitten, but I hates children, and they can't abide me. That's odd, ain't it? Aye. Yes, that's Daniel Drus's story, as far as we knows it down in these parts. Maybe you know more. Maybe I do. Now I dare swear there was a woman at the bottom of it all. I never got my chain cable kinked, but a woman had an hand in it. Marple coming forward. Ark ye, my lad, you're hard on woman. From the look of you, I've a notion no woman ever had much to do with any trouble of yours, saving your mother when she bore you. No, no, your tongue's done all the mischief that ever come to you. You let woman alone. I'm sure they never interfere with you. Enter Daniel Drews. He has a bundle of nets over his shoulder, and he is half tipsy. His appearance is that of a man of fifty, but haggard with want. His hair is long and matted, and he has a beard of some day's growth on his chin. Hello. Who's that? Joe Ripley, eh? Why, Joe Ripley, what dost thou do skulking in other men's huts when they're away? Nothing to lay hands on here, Joe Ripley, and thou's brought a friend, eh? Didst thee think that there was too much plunder for a man to carry, that thou'st brought an ass to help thee? There's nought for the year. Take thine ugly face into the storm. Maybe thou'll get it battered straight. Come out with thee. All thy peace, man. I want not of thine. I brought thee money for thy two nets. Where is it? And here's a man as says he's thy brother, and I wish him joy of his brotherhood. I found him in the village asking for ye, so I brought him to ye. Marple holds out his hand. Daniel, not heeding him. Give me the money. Dost thou not know me, Jonas Marple? Dead. Dead three years ago. I. Thou gavest thyself out as dead, that he might make an honest woman of her. Thou liest. She was an honest woman, for all she left me. Twas him that stole her. God bless her. Jonas Marple died the day she left him. I'm Daniel Drews. I knew there was a woman in it. And if Jonas be dead... Hast thou no word of welcome to Jonas's brother? None. To Ripley. Give me the money. Here, I count it. We're all thieves and lawyers. To Marco. That's his craze. Is it right? I don't know. I can't count tonight. Let it be. I'll count it tomorrow. To Marco. How didst thou find me? I found thee through this fellow. I was in the town on law business, and I heard men talk of such a one as thou, and I asked and asked and found out that thou wast the brother who used to work with me. I've come to ask thee to come back to us and be the man thou wast wont to be. Come, man, be thine old self, thou canst not be better. Throw off thy present self, thou canst not be worse. Not worse? Why, man, I'm a king alone here. Here I live, free from liars and thieves, alone, alone. What back to the world, the hollow lying world, not I. Back to the rock on which my ship was wrecked, not I. Back to the den of thieves that stripped me, 
Not I. No, no. I don't find fish come back to my nets when once they've slipped through the meshes. And I'm no more a fool than my fish. See here, I've lived here nigh upon four years, and except in some gaping fool as him, indicating Ripley, I've seen no soul, and no soul's seen me. I've done harm to no one, and none's done harm to me. I've told no lies, and no lies ain't been told me. I've rubbed no one, and no one's rubbed me. Can anyone who walks the world say as much? I've lived on the fish I've caught, the garden I've dug, and I've saved money by the nets I've made. Not much, a trifle to such as thou, and I've sent it far from here. I never keep it here, no, no. I've no hopes, no cares, no fears. And thou askest me to go back into the foul old world, the world that poor dead and gone Jonas Marple was rocked in, the bitter black world that blighted his poor harmless life. No, I'm going to bide here. Well, as thou wilt, Jonas. Dan'l, that's my name, Dan'l Druce. Jonas Marple died the day his wife left him. His wife's a widow, and Mayap married again. God bless her. Thou'lt do no good with him. Ere's a devil's flare in his eyes. Best let him bide. Aye, best let him bide. I'm a poor thing of skin and bone. And this here arm, which made light of a forty-pound hammer four years since, is but a soft road thing now. But when muscle went out, devil came in. Steer clear o' me, and let me bide. Thou art sadly changed. It's fearsome to see a good, honest, hearty soul changed into the white-faced ghost of what he was. Time was when every beggar had the pulling of thy poor purse-strings, and none were turned empty away from the door. To think that Jonas Marple should have earned the name of Miser. Does it seem so strange to thee? Hast thou e'er known what it is to set thy heart night and day on one object, to dream of it, sleeping and waking, to find the hope of it flavouring thy meat and drink, and weaving itself so into thy life that every thought of thy brain is born of it, and every deed of thy hand has some bearing on it? And having done all this, and so fashioned, and twisted, and turned, and trimmed the chances at thy hand, that the one hope of thy soul shall be helped on by it, hast thou known what it is to find, at one bitter, black blow, thy hope made helpless, thy love loveless, thy life lifeless. So did I hope, and pray to be blessed with a little child, so was my hope withered, when I thought it sure of fulfilment. I had a store of love in my battered heart to set on some one thing of my creating. It was there for that end and for none other. Then she left me. Curse him. I knew for certain that one thing would never be of flesh and blood, and it never will, for the love of my heart is given over to the next best thing, gold and silver, gold and silver. Ay, brother, I love my gold as other men love their bairns. It's of my making, and I love it. I love it. A mean and sordid love, maybe, but hard and bad, and base as thou thinkest me. I prayed a thousand times that my gold might take a living form, that the one harmless old hope of my wrecked life might come true. The age of miracles is past, Jonas. Well, I've said my say and done my due. Stay where thou art, and heaven forgive thee, Jonas Marple. He's dead. He is. Dead to the call of reason, dead to the voice of human love. Dead to everything that mocks a reason in man off from the beasts that perish. Thou hast well said. Jonas Marple is dead. Rest his soul. Amen. Now, go. Marple, after a pause, shrugs his shoulders and exit with Ripley. Aye, he's dead. 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 He died then. 
that the blackest devil that ever cursed this earth might put her right with the world. Heaven send he has done so, and the bairn, it was promised to me, promised, but the promise was a lie, a damned black lie, not hers, no, no, not hers, but the double-dyed devil who stole her from me. Opens a hole in the floor in front of stool and takes out a bag of money. This is my bairn now. Handling the money. See, here's another day to thy life, another inch to thy height. Grow as thou growest, child, and thou'lt be a golden beauty ere long. Gold, the best thing in the world. As good as gold. Why, it's a saying, the best thing on earth to make a bairn of. Here's a child that'll never grow up to bring sorrow on its dad's head. That costs now to keep, and never grows so big but you wish it bigger. My bairn, I've worked for thee, and starved for thee, that I might see thee grow, and thou hast growed, growed right royally. Lie here, my beauty, lie there in peace. I'll never wake thee, but to add to thy life, my bairn, my beautiful golden bairn. The door is suddenly burst open, and Sir Jasper Combe enters hurriedly, followed by Reuben as if pursued. They are both very ragged and dirty, dressed in torn and faded royalist uniforms. Sir Jasper, an officer, Reuben, a sergeant. Reuben carries a child of three or four years of age, wrapped in a cloak, so as not to be seen by Daniel. They close the door hurriedly and listen for their pursuers. Reuben places child on locker. At last! Safe at last for the yelping bloodhounds! By the Lord Harry, but if many bouts with death, this is the bout that had like to have gone hardest with us, Reuben. Who and what are ye, jailbirds? Ark, sir, I think I hear them again. Listening eagerly. Who and what are ye? Going up to them. Jasper, listening. Hold that fool's tongue or I'll slit it. But? Reuben placing his hand over Daniel's mouth. Nay! It is necessary that someone hold thy tongue, and if thou wilt not do it, I must. Listen to me, my friend. Reuben removes his hand from Daniel's mouth. He again attempts to speak. Reuben again gags him. Nay, cover him up. He will hear the better for that he cannot give tongue the while. Now, keep thine ears open, for this concerns thee. We are prescribed royalists. And you, miserable man, have harboured us. Heaven help you, and if we are taken here, I and he and thou will surely hang. I and he from our sins against the Parliament, thou for thy virtue in aiding and abetting and comforting us. Dost thou clearly understand me? Reuben, with his hand still over Daniel's mouth. Dost thou clearly understand the Colonel? Daniel cannot answer. Dost thou clearly understand the Colonel? Jasper to Reuben. When thou desirest him to be silent, it is well to gag him. When thou wouldst have him speak, it is judicious to remove the gag. As you will, sir. Now then. Removing his hand. Dost thou clearly understand? I clearly understand that ye are two marauding devils who... Reuben hastily clapping his hand over Daniel's mouth. He does not understand... Jasper, listening. They've wheeled about, and their hooves are dying away in the distance. Reuben, let the old beggar go. He may give tongue now till he splits his lungs if he will. We are safe, at least for the present, Reuben. And see to thy pistol. We may have to stand the siege yet, and this door must be barricaded. But with what? Daniel, taking up an iron bar from the fireplace and holding it in a threatening attitude. Go your ways, both of ye. Or as I am a man, I'll brain ye with this bar. The very thing. Wrenches it easily out of his hand and barricades the door with it, while Reuben shows Daniel a pistol. There. Why, it's made for it a thousand thanks, old gentleman. Daniel recovers himself, flies at Jasper, who pushes him away. He falls onto a stool. 
Now, master, listen to me. If you have any respect for yourself, keep your ears open, for I'm speaking words of life and death. We are desperate men in a desperate strait, and little disposed to stand on ceremony, as you may perhaps have remarked. We are flying for our lives, and we desire to cross to France, where my lady is, and where we shall be safe. To carry out this design, we have worked our way to the coast, sleeping under hedges and ricks for six bleak days, and trampling in the wind's eye for six stormy nights, till the fire of life seems to have died out of our bodies and our legs to have with withered from their trunks. You have a stout boat on the beach. When this accursed gale shall have blown itself out, you shall have the distinction of working us across to the opposite coast. In the meantime, we appoint you our host, and we shall be prepared to look favourably on whatever meat or drink you can set before us. Do I look like a man who keeps open house? No, hang me if you do. If I had my way, I'd hang you anyhow. Aye, and there's many more of your way of thinking. I'll be sworn there are. Well, get out of my hut. Rises. This is not your way. This is not the road to the gallows. My good fellow, that's why we took it. Who in the devil's name are ye? I'm a cavalier colonel, a trifle out of repair and a, a thought begrimed, maybe, but that'll wash off. Royalist to the backbone, as I proved some time since at Worcester where my backbone had to bear the brunt of the flight. This is my regiment, the King's Dragoons. Indicating Reuben. Come doff thy hat, King's Dragoons, and salute the gentleman. The credit of the corps is in thy keeping. Reuben, for thou art all that's left of it. To Daniel. A worthy fellow, this regiment of mine, but somewhat shy and constrained in good company, but, but he will improve when he sees that flask of shydom that thou art about to surprise us with. Now tell me, art thou for Parliament? No. Then thou art for the King? It's a lie. I'm for myself. And for us? Nay, I'll be damned if I am. Nay, I'll swear thou art for us, if thou be not traitor to thyself. For if we hang at all, we all hang together. I'll see to that. Now, what food have you got? None. What can you get? Nothing. Where are we, then? Nowhere. Harky, sir. I'm just in that mood that I don't care the flush of a flint whose life is swept out of my way when it comes betwixt me and my wants. I want food. Get it. I've no food. I'm a beggar. Here's a coin. Our last. Go and get bread, meat and drink. Now be off or Reuben here shall whip you with his sword flat till he drops. Reuben draws. And mark me, if by deed, word or sign you do ought to give a clue to our hiding place, I'll burn the hut to the ground and everything in it. But? Reuben pushes him. Not a word. Be off and do your errands. And mind, no treachery or... Jasper takes a burning log from the fire and holds it immediately over the hole where Daniel's money is concealed. Daniel snatches it from him. Put that down, put that down, for the love of heaven. Put it down, I say. You'll have the hut afire, and I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do. Daniel throws log on fire and exit. Oh, I brought the old devil to his senses. What a life this is. Was ever poor dog so hounded about from pillar to post as Jasper Coombe? And for no better reason than that he is a gentleman and loves his king. Pardon, sir. But I was never accounted a gentleman, and as for my king, I care not one jot. Yet am I hounded much as you are. Thou art hounded much, as I am, because thou thyself art as I am, though in a lower degree. King Charles is my king. Raise his head. God bless him, and I serve him, and am hunted for so doing. Jasper Coombe is thy king. Reuben raises his head. God bless him likewise, and thou servest him, and thou art hunted for doing so. The analogy is complete. 
Be thou as faithful to thy king as I am to mine, and thy king will reward thee, when my king rewards me. Is the child safe? Reuben uncovering the child and bringing it down. Aye, sir, thanks to my cloak. Though I'm but a sorry dry nurse, having taken to it late in life. But it's never too late to learn, and I've learnt this, that babes won't eat ship's biscuits, and strong waters choke them. Their poor little heads can't stand strong waters. I'll marry some day on that piece of knowledge. Add this to it, to my dower, that when thou art flying for thy life, it's best to leave thy babes behind. A dozen times we might have got away, but for being hampered with this squalling abomination. Was ever officer of cavalry accursed with such a ridiculous element of peril? Was ever sergeant of horse armed with such a mischief-dealing implement? Well, there's no help for it. My lady would have gone mad had I returned to her without it. She's devotedly attached to the child. Strange, that attachment that some mothers have to their children. My mother always disliked me and kept me at a convenient distance. But she was a Scotch woman and not liable to be imposed on. Well, we must make the best of a bad job. Here, how cold it is. Chill to the marrow of my bones. That fellow is taking his leisure over this errand. See, Reuben, if thou canst find art in the hut. Here's a locker, your honour, but close fastened. A proof that there's something in it. Start it with thy sword. Stay, I'll do it. Takes up hatchet. So, gently. Open slocker. Good, a crust of bread and some dried fish. And a bottle of right good shy dam that never paid duty, I'll be sworn. Jasper taking it. And on that account, a fairly forfeit to the crown, which, on this occasion, I represent. So, bring an armful of those logs and make a merry blaze. For I ache as though I was trussed in a suit of thumb screws. Reuben brings wood. That's well. <laughs> now... Let us enjoy ourselves. Who would have thought the dingy old pigsty had so much life in it? It's the first good blaze I've seen since the long-nosed devils fired the old mill we lived in. Come, we'll be jolly. Reuben takes a piece of bread. Jasper snatches it from him. Nay, for food there's but enough for one. Jasper eats. Reuben takes up bottle and holds it to the light. Jasper snatches it from him. And of Shidem, there's not e nearly enough for one. Why, thou gross and sensuous violet, canst thou not be jolly without meat and drink? Tis always so with a base born of intellectual recreation. I have no notion whatsoever. I've eaten nothing for two days, and I'm hungry. Thou'll have to wait till the old scoundrel returns. Reuben at door. There's no sign of him yet. Then. Give rein to thy voice and hail him. He took the road to the left. Exit Reuben shouting. His voice dies away in the distance. Here's a plight for the lord of Coombe Raven. Stripped of an ancestral mansion and two thousand old acres. Hunted to his death by the bordering bloodhounds. Separated from his pretty wife by some two hundred miles of barren land and stormy water and saddled with a confounded brat that hampers his flight, let him turn whichsoever way he will, and say that I cross this accursed channel. How am I to get to Paris, penniless as I am, when I think of what I have before me, I'm minded to make short work with this world and try another by the Lord Harry. Stamps impatiently. His foot starts a board over Daniel's hoard. Ha! Huh. Why? What's this? Not gold? Takes out some. Golden in perfusion. There's a way out of our difficulties. If Coombe Raven were but the man to take it. The old miser. Handling the money. Bah, in another week's time we may perhaps come down to this sort of thing. Who knows? But not yet. No, not yet. Throws it into hole. Lie there. 
I'll not meddle with thee, though. Closing hole. Don't be spent on a worse errand than helping Jasper Combe to his wife and his king, I'll be sworn. Enter Reuben in breathless haste. Jasper quickly covers the hole. Yes, sir, we must fly, and that at once. Uh, what do you mean? I mean treachery. The old man has played us false. I hear the horse's hooves in the distance. A thousand devils wring his damnable neck. Run to the boat, get him ready for the sea. I'll join thee at once. We'll launch it together. But... Well? If there's such a thing as a crust of bread or a tailored droid mackerel... But there's not. Be off. He watches him out, then quickly turns to the hole in which the money is concealed. So this changes the aspect of affairs. Old fool, thou hast betrayed us. This is fair plunder. Takes it out of the hole. With fair luck we may beat across to France tonight. And once there, we're safe. For the child, again, a clog on our movements. She would surely perish in an open boat on such a night as this. It's a matter of life and death, her life as well as mine. It would be murder to take her to sea with us, and it would be murder to remain and fight these fellows with her in our arms. There's no help for it. I must leave her here. This locket will serve to identify her. Putting a locket and chain on her neck. And I'll reclaim her when I get across. They'll never harm a child. Enter Reuben hurriedly. Sir, sir, the troops are upon us. They're not two hundred yards off. I'm coming. Exit Reuben. Jasper writes on a piece of paper and pins it on the child's dress. So I was there. And God help thee, little one. I'm loath to leave thee, but it's for life and death. For life and death. Jasper leaps through the window as Daniel and the sergeant, with four soldiers in parliamentary uniform, enter at the door. Daniel sees blaze of log fire. Far, far, he is far at the hut, he is far at the hut. Nay, fool, tis but thy blazing hearth, thy hut's safe enough. Where are thy prisoners? Oh, the reckless prodigal, see how he hath wasted my substance. There are no men hidden here. The sons of Belial have escaped. Why thou hast betrayed us, and if so, thou shalt hang for it. Second soldier mounts ladder to get him to loft. They were here, but the noise of thy horse's hoofs has alarmed them, and they are gone. I warned thee to tether thy beast to far and proceed silently. See, they are putting off from the beach. Second soldier descends ladder and makes ready to fire. My boat! Oh, my boat! Bring down the Philistines, Nahum. A steady shot under the fifth rib, and may the Lord have mercy on them. I will even smite them hip and thigh. He fires through the window. Missed. Others fire outside. Nay, the beyond range. May heaven mercifully overwhelm them in the great waters. Daniel sees hole in floor. Gone, gone, sergeant, see, they are gone. They were hidden in here, and they're gone. In there? Nay, there's never room for two stout men in that cranny. Men? Curse the men. It's my gold, my gold. They've stolen it. They've robbed me. Sixty golden pounds, all I had, all I had, and it's gone. My child, my child, they've stolen my child. <laughs> Weeps passionately on his knees. Nay, man, see thy child safe enough, and a bonny lass she be. Taking up child from behind table, Daniel raising his head stupidly. Hey, why, what's that? Thy child, uh, come back, be thyself. The child's safe enough. Places child on ground. He's crazed. Daniel, stupefied. That's not mine. My gold is my child. The gold that the infernal villains have taken. Here's a paper and some words writ on it. Read, read. I cannot read. Sergeant reads. 
Be kind to the child, and it shall profit thee. Grieve not for thy gold. It hath taken this form. Music. Daniel on his knees, taking the child. A miracle! A miracle! Down on your knees, down, I say, for heaven has worked a miracle to save me. This money for which I toiled night and day, and which I loved and worshipped, was to me as a child, a dear, dear child. I prayed that this might be, but scoffers mocked me when I prayed, and said that the days of miracles were past. But they lied, and my prayer has been hearkened to. See, it has her eyes, her eyes, my darling, my darling, my heaven-sent bairn, thou hast brought me back to reason, to manhood, to life. The soldiers crowd round him. First soldier offers to touch the child. Hands off, hands off. All fall back. Touch not the Lord's gift. Touch not the Lord's gift. Tableau. Daniel, the child on the ground before him, soldiers grouped around. End of Act One Act Two of Daniel Drew's Blacksmith by W. S. Gilbert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two Scene The interior of a picturesque old forge. The forge is open at the back and Druce's cottage is seen through opening. There is a path off. Daniel Druce, a hearty-looking old man of sixty-four, is discovered hammering lustily at a piece of red-hot iron on his anvil. Daniel, laying down his hammer. Phew! That job's done, eh? But I'm that breathed surely. Why, Daniel Druce, if thou worked out like this at twelve o' noon, it's time you thought of getting a partner into the old forge. But somehow the forge fire seems to strike hotter than a yore, and the iron of today takes more hammering than the iron of thirty year ago. Maybe I'm growing old. Well, a body can't hope to live sixty-four a year and leave off a young un arter all. Twouldn't be fair on the boys, no, nor the gals neither, eh, Dorothy? Enter Dorothy running. Oh, father, thou should see the green by Rabbi's end. The village is brave with banners and garlands. I have helped to deck it, father, and Master Maynard, the constable, is mounted on an ale cask to receive Sir Jasper Combe, who should pass on his way to Combe Raven in half an hour. And the band of music hath arrived from Norwich, and there all on ale cask too, and they are to play stirring music while the constable readeth an address to his worship. It is a merciful provision, Dorothy, lest the address be heard. So, Sir Jasper will be here in half an hour, eh? Yes, and I long to see him. I have heard that he is a grave gentleman of goodly presence and beyond measure kindly. He is a righteous landlord, too, so folks say, and giveth largely to the poor. He is needed in these parts, for the poor were sorely used by the late squire. I shall be right glad to welcome him. But... We really... I'll not go to Raby's end to do it. Sits on stool. Art thou wearied, father? Growing old, lass, growing old. It's one of those blessings that Alice comes to him that waits long enough. But I don't grumble, Dorothy. If old age will leave me strength enough to pull at a pipe and empty a tankard, two things thou canst not do for me, Dorothy. Why, that's all I ask. My lass can do the rest. As I have been to thee, so will I be to the end. There's no saying, Dorothy. Thou'rt comely, lass, and maybe, ere long, some smart young lad will whip thee from my arms and carry thee away to t'other side of the sunrise. There's more'n one within a mile o' this who would give his right arm to do it now. Nay, thou art unkind. Did I not tend thee when thou wast hale and strong, and shall I desert thee now that thou hast most need of me? Daniel, with emotion. My lass, heaven knows I never needed thee more than when thou wast left at my hut fourteen years since. But I've news to gladden thee. Thine old playmate, Geoffrey Wynyard, 
his return from sea, and is now on his road from Norwich to see thee. Geoffrey returned. Oh, I am right glad. Oh, indeed, father, I am right glad. Truly thou hast brought me fair news. And is he well? And hath he prospered? Aye, and growed out a knowledge. He was but a long-legged lad when he left, but he's a man now, and a goodly one, I warrant thee. See to him when he cometh, for he'll bide here with us. After a pause. My darling, thou'lt never leave me? Never while I live. God bless thee, my child. Kisses her and exit. Geoffrey returned, and Geoffrey a stalwart mariner, and grown to man's estate. I can scarce believe it. Of a truth, I could weep for very joy. I was but a child when he left, and now I am seventeen. Geoffrey loved children. It may be that he will be displeased with me now that I am a woman. I am rejoiced that I am decked in my new gown. It is more seemly than the russet in which methinks I did look pale. Geoffrey, a man, my old playmate, a man. Pity that I have not my new shoes, for they are comely, but they do compress my feet and so pain me sorely. Nevertheless, I will put them on, for it behoveth a maiden to be neatly apparelled at all seasons. Enter Geoffrey. Mistress Dorothy. Dorothy, turning. She starts. Geoffrey! Oh, Geoffrey! She rushes towards him. Mistress Dorothy, I am right glad to hold thy little hand once more. I have had this moment in view for many, many months. And I too, Master Geoffrey, and oh, I am indeed rejoiced. How thou art grown. A woman, by my right hand a very woman. Yes, Master Geoffrey, I am a woman now. And a fair one, Mistress Dorothy. She turns. Nay, it is but truth, and truth is made to be told. May I not say that thou art fair? Yes, Master Geoffrey, if thou thinkest so in good sooth. In good sooth I do. It is strange to be back in the old village again after three years of blue water. And yet it seems but yesterday that we tossed hay together in the five-acre field. I think the time must speed more swiftly with those who seek their fortunes in distant lands, for though I have been happy and full of content, yet it seemeth more than three years since thy departure. Yet barely three years have gone. Dorothy, sighing. It seemeth more. The time hath sped with me despite the long night watches and the never-ending days of a calm tropical sea. For no hour is so long with that I can fill it with thoughts of thee, Mistress Dorothy. I am rejoiced to know this, for my mind has often dwelt on thy fortunes. Many a time, when the old forge rocked in the wintry gale, my heart has been sad for thee, and I have lain awake weeping and praying for... for... For me? For all who go down to the sea in ships. In truth, if the sea had no other charm, I would be a sailor, that I might have thy prayers, Mistress Dorothy. Nay, but if it consisted with thy duty to abandon thy perilous calling and bide here with us for ever, my poor prayers would still be thine, Master Geoffrey. But thou lovest the sea. Sighing. All sailors love the sea. It is strange, for the sea is cold and cruel and fierce, and many brave men are yearly swallowed up of it. Dorothy, I love the sea dearly. There is but one love that is strong in my heart, one love for which I would yield it up for ever and ever. Dear Dorothy, I have loved thee, boy and man, for ten years past, and I shall love thee, come what may, through my life. I came here today to tell thee this. I thought how to say it, but all that I thought of is gone. It's my heart that's speaking now and not my tongue. Bear with me, Dorothy, the every hope of my life, every waking and sleeping dream of ten years past, is in the words I'm speaking now. Oh, Geoffrey, Geoffrey, I know not what to say. Fear not for thy father, for I will quit the sea. Sir Jasper has offered to make me his secretary, and that is why I have come. 
but say nay, and I must needs go to sea again. Oh, Geoffrey, let me think, let me think. Do I love thee? I cannot say. It may be that I do, and yet... Thou must not go to sea. Oh, I have given no thought to it. Truly thou art dear to me, for I am rejoiced when thou comest, and I am sorely grieved when thou goest. Is that love? Dorothy, let us inquire into this. Right willingly, for if I love thee I would fain know it, that I might gladden thine heart by telling thee so. Then attend to me, sweetheart, while I paint a picture for thee. We will suppose that I have given up the sea, that I have bought a little farm near at hand, and that I have come to live here, close to thee and thy father, for the rest of my life. Canst thou see the picture I am painting? Aye, it is a pleasant picture. Living here, close to thee, I naturally see thee very often. Dorothy pleased. Every day. Twice, maybe thrice a day, for my horses need much shoeing, and I always bring them to the forge myself. Is that pleasant? Very pleasant. And on Sabbath thou takest me to church? Aye, save only when some other village gallant is beforehand with me and offers to escort thee thither, and in such case I am fain to take farmer such a one's daughter instead. Nay, that were needless, for I would have no other escort than thou. Yet it behooves one to be neighbourly, and if farmer such a one says to me, Come and see Susan, for she's lonely and wants cheering. Susan? That's the farmer's daughter. Is she fair? Very fair. What then? Why then, thou wouldst not go. Geoffrey, slyly. And wherefore not? Wherefore not? Oh, well, wherefore not, indeed? Go to Susan, if thou wilt, Geoffrey. It is not for me to hinder thee. Well, then, I would not go. And so we live on, happy, very, very happy, for, say, a year. But a change is at hand. My crops fail, my cattle die, and one evil night my homestead is burnt to the ground, and I am penniless. Oh! So there is nothing for it but to go to sea again, for three long years. No, no, Geoffrey, oh, no. The time of parting draws near. A few weeks, a few days, a few hours. These few hours we have passed in silence, sitting hand in hand, thou and I. There are tears in my eyes, though I strive to check them, and there are sad thoughts in thine heart also. Well, at last the horse is at the door, and it is time to go. I am at thy porch, one foot in stirrup, one hurried God speed, and I am gone. Oh, no, no, Geoffrey, I cannot bear it. Months pass by and no news of me. The village seems blank at first without me. The walks to church seem long and lonely, and the evenings sad and cheerless. At last come tidings of a wrecked ship. Thine heart beats quickly, for the name of the ship is the name of mine. Of all the crew but one man is saved, and that man's name is not Geoffrey Wynyard, for Geoffrey has gone down to his death in the dark waters. Dorothy, rising, throwing her arms around him. No, no, Geoffrey, be silent. I cannot bear it. I cannot bear it. I cannot bear it. Have mercy, for I cannot bear it. And dost thou love me? Dorothy, bashfully, hiding her head in his bosom. Oh, Geoffrey. Pause. Art thou happy there, Dorothy? Passing happy. And thou? Passing happy. He places a ring on her finger. Oh, Geoffrey, what is this? A ring that I have brought thee from Venice, where there are cunning workers in such matters. Let it stay there in earnest of another ring of plainer workmanship that is not beyond the craft of our English goldsmiths to fashion. But I know not if I may wear it. It is a vanity, but it is very beautiful. See how it shineth? Oh, pity I may not wear it, for in truth it is very beautiful. Thou hast a silver chain with thy mother's locket on thy neck. Wear it on thy chain. 
Would it be a vanity if it is concealed beneath thy kerchief? Nay, for none will know of it. Withdraws a silver locket from her bosom. See, the clasp will not hold them both. Stay, the locket shall be thine, and thy ring shall take its place. Detaches locket and gives it to him. He kisses her. Enter Daniel Drews. They stand confused. Daniel, after a pause, sighs deeply. Ah, tell me about it, my pretty. Master Daniel, I... No, lad, no, not from thee. I'd liefer hear it from my pretty. Dorothy going to him and putting her arms round his neck. Dear father, Geoffrey hath told me that he loveth me and would fain take me to be his wife. Ay, ay, lass, go on. He loveth me very dearly, father, and will quit the sea to bide with us here. Go on. He loveth me so dearly that it would sadden his life if I were to wed with another. Well? So, dear father, as I would not cause him sorrow, I will not wed with another. Hiding her face on his shoulder. So soon, so soon. Nay, hang there a bit longer, my lass, for thou art all I have, and thou art going from me o'er soon, and of thine own free will. Dorothy, ah, Dorothy, the hope and the stay of my poor old life. My saving angel, my saving angel, it's hard to part with thee, Dorothy. He will not love thee as I love thee. With an effort. I'm but a thankless man. It was to be, and twould better fit me to rejoice that thou hast found a brave and honest man to tend thee when I am gone. Get thee within and dry thine eyes. I'll do thy weeping for thee, Dorothy. Exit Dorothy into the cottage. It's come sudden, my lad. It's come sudden, and I don't rightly know how to shift without her. She's been more than life to me, Dolly has. I was a hard and bitter man when she was left with me fourteen years since, for I'd been cruelly warped, cruelly warped. But when things are at their worst, like as not thou mend. And from the time my darling was sent to me, by a miracle as then I thought, for I'd been brought up among folk to see a miracle in most everything. A change crept over me, and bit by bit, my cruel old heart growed soft again. I was a foul-tongued fellow then, but I couldn't swear a foreign angel come straight from heaven. I was cruel and hard, but I couldn't sit glaring at mankind with her little arms round my neck and her soft cheek again my wicked old face. Then it come about that Dolly must be taught her Bible. But I had no Bible, so with a shamefaced lie on my tongue, I borrowed a good book, and we spelled it out together. And then is the time as the old half-forgotten words come back to me, bit by bit, and I called to mind when I first learned her as child, I laid my head down on the book and wept like a woman. And as it was for me, God help me, to teach her right from wrong, I learned as I taught, and the light come to us together, the old man and the little child. And as she growed in knowledge, my right self growed in strength, and such as I am, hale, hearty, and happy, living by the sweat of my brow, owing no man, fearing none, and loving all. Why, she has made me. God bless her. And thou hast never seen her father since? No, though for years I never passed a strange face, but I peered into it, for I knowed every line of his, so I never heard his name, knowed it. Why, it burned in my eyeballs, so that I see it in the dark. I see it everywhere. I see it in the forge, and be sure I raked it out. I see it red hot on my anvil, and be sure I hammered with a will. After a while, but it was a weary while, the thought came that mayhap he had perished in the gale. So I thought less about it, 
and Dolly seemed more like my own. Yet the old fear comes back, odd times, and, oh, Geoffrey, it's like enough she'll be taken from me yet. Enter Dorothy from Cottage. O oh, father, a gentleman whose horse hath cast a shoe hath need of thy services in the yard. A gentleman, eh? It is Master Reuben Haynes, Sir Jasper's bailiff. He passed this way twice to prepare for Sir Jasper's arrival, but that was when thou wast away at Norwich. And what manner of man is he? A strange man, full of unmeaning jests, who maketh faces at me which doth fright me much, and he rolleth his eyes in a manner fearful to behold. A town fashion, Dolly, who knows? <laughs> Take no heed of his faces, make him welcome. For there's no foreseeing it may serve us one day to stand well with the bailiff. Come, Geoffrey, and lend me a hand. I'll see to his horse. Geoffrey kisses Dorothy and exit with Daniel. Enter Reuben in riding dress from cottage. Good morrow, pretty mistress Dorothy. We have not forgotten one another, I see. And how is time sped with thee since I saw thee last? Has it crept, crawled, drawled, dragged, and dawdled for lack of a certain merry old man who whiled away a certain half hour with thee two months since with curious quip, quaint retort, and surprising conundrum? Dost thou remember that half hour, Dorothy? I do. In the course of it, I said many rare things to thee complimentary and insinuating things of amatory significance and connubial import neatly disguised or as one may say embalmed in an outer husk of delicate epigram and thou didst listen ye gods how thou didst listen i love a good listener sir i do indeed remember your coming but as for your sayings, I was silent, for I understood them not. Is, is Sir Jasper at hand? And the Daniel Drews, unobserved, at back. He will be here anon. Some village clowns are plaguing him with an address, a scurvy long one, and written very false jingle. I heard the first lines thereof. It began... Sir Jasper Coombe, to welcome you, we do as much as we can do. Here live and die, to house and tomb, we welcome you, Sir Jasper Coombe. It did so move me to laughter that Sir Jasper, who asked no sense of the ridiculous, did order me to ride on. But I doubt not that even he is laughing heartily thereat by this time. Daniel, who has heard the last few lines. Nay, sir, but if Sir Jasper deserve all that men say of him, he will scarcely hold in scorn that which poor humble folks have written his praise. Reuben to Dorothy. Who is this old gentleman? I am Daniel Druce, no gentleman, but a hard-working blacksmith, very much at your honour's service. Looking at him. I was away when you last come to the village, yet I think I've seen your honour's face. It is very like. It is a striking face. I don't like it myself, but others do, so I yield to the majority. It is a good face. I cannot recall where I have seen it. It signifieth not. Thou wilt have plenty of time to study it for thou wilt see it every quarter day whilst thou livest. Despite its inherent goodliness, it will come to be a face of evil significance to thee, speaking, as it will, of raised rents, rapid distraint, and uncompromising ejection. I am a punctual tenant, sir, and I fear no man. Dorothy, draw this gentleman's mail while I look to his horse. Exit. And take thy time, for we are very well thus, eh, Dorothy? Dorothy going. Nay, do not go. I never eat the ale. 
i'd rather take a long look at thy pretty face than a long pull at thy village brew the one is sweet i know the other is sour i'll swear come hither dorothy nay sir i i have news to tell thee dorothy thou art a kind of wife of mine for i have in a manner married thee intellectually and reflectively or as one may say in a mental or moral sense have i married thee i have as it were invented thee as my wife and the invention is none the less mine because a scurvy mechanic to wit the parson has not yet hammered in the rivets aside a quip sir i do not rightly understand thy talk but it seemeth to me that thou makest jest of solemn things nay this time i am in earnest if thou wilt be my wife i will so call thee coax thee cosset thee court thee cajole thee with deftly turned compliment pleasant whimsy delicate jest and tuneful madrigal i will so pleasantly perplex thee with quaint paradox entertaining aphorism false conclusion and contradiction in terms i will so edify thee with joyous anecdote tales of court and camp tales of love hate and intrigue tales of murder rapine and theft merry tales sad tales long tales short tales quip crank retort repartee and rejoinder that thy wedded life shall seem one never-ending honeymoon and thou shalt find but one fault with me that i clog thee with sweets takes her round waist nay sir i pray you remove your hand sir you are unmannerly i pray you desist enter sir jasper dorothy runs to him oh sir defend me from this wicked man why reuben haynes thou art at thine old tricks again at our old tricks your honour hark ye sirrah let bygones go by times are changed with me as thou knowest well and if thou valuest thy stewardship adapt thy morals to those of thy master if thou sayest or dost aught to anger this gentle maiden i lay my whip across thy shoulders as i have done oft times ere this reuben aside we are virtuous now but time was when we would have angered her in company nay sir i pray you bear with him reuben aside she pleadeth for me bless her pretty face she pleadeth for me has the rascal then found favour in thine eyes dorothy aside to sir jasper oh no but whenever he cometh to the forge he saith such strange things and looketh at me with such strange looks that i fear he is sorely afflicted and not to be held accountable for his deeds ha 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 why in truth i sometimes think so too to reuben oh, get thee to the inn sir we shall lie there to-night as for the whipping why the maiden's intercession hath saved thee this once she pleadeth for me bless their hearts they're all alike they all plead for me exit reuben and now pretty maiden tell me who art thou so please your worship i am dorothy druce only daughter of daniel druce the blacksmith and your worship's tenant jasper looking kindly at her he's a kind father to thee i'll be sworn he is kind to me and to all in very truth i think he must be the best man in the whole world and thou tendest him very carefully yes indeed i am with him from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof and we love each other with a love that passeth all telling jasper after a pause dorothy i once had a little child who promised to grow up to be 
just such a pretty lass as thou. But we, we were separated many years ago, and I've never seen her since. Oh, poor gentleman. Poor, indeed, for I declare to thee, Dorothy, that, that I would give all my substance, were it ten times what it is, to have her with me in my old age, but though I have sought her high and low for many a weary year, I found no tidings of her, and so I must needs go on to the end, a solitary old man, uncared for and alone. There's a doleful tale, little Dorothy. Indeed, it is passing sad, and my heart bleeds for your worship. I am even more grieved for thy daughter, who hath lost the fostering care and guidance of so worthy a gentleman. I am sure she would have loved your worship very dearly. Jasper moved. Uh, I know not. It, it may be so, and yes, I showed myself but a careless and unloving father to her when we were parted. But her mother died of grief, and, and I would fain make amends. I would fain make amends. Yes, Dorothy, it would have gone hard with me, but I would have made her love me. Enter Daniel. Who is this good fellow? This is my father of whom I spoke unto your worship. Father, this is Sir Jasper Combe. At your worship's service, Sir Jasper. I've naught to say, sir, but what's been said by better men. Welcome to Coombe Raven. I'll go bail, my Dorothy's said it already. Indeed, as she has given me a very kindly greeting, Master Druce. I was telling thy daughter how I came to be wifeless and childless, and how desolate I am. I envy thee thy good fortune in having so fair a little nurse to cosset thee in thine old age. Take heed, though, that she does not take and from thee, and at a brief notice, too, one of these days. During this speech, Daniel has gradually recognised Sir Jasper. He is stupefied with terror and staggers back on Anvil. I say, take care, that she be not taken from thee one of these days. Daniel, still stupefied. By whom? Taken from me by whom? <laughs> oh, never fear me, Daniel, by some far younger man than I. Aye, aye, to be married. Ah. Uh, Maybe, maybe. Father, is odd amiss? Daniel, faintly. No, lass, no. Take no heed of me. Dorothy leading him to stool. My father hath been working in the heat of the day, and he is faint. Yes, I've been working hard. Take no heed of me. I'm better now. I'm an old man, and weaker than oh you are. Take no heed. I'll send thee strong wines that shall put the courage and strength of youth into thine old heart, Donald Bruce. There, there, bear up, man. And Dorothy must come to the hall, Donald. Old Bridget shall take good care of her, and I own I should like to see how the old place would shine in the sunlight shed by so fair a little lady. There, be of good cheer, man. I did but jest when I spake of thy daughter leaving thee. Aye, aye, thou didst but jest, hey? Why, to be sure. Aside. To think that those few light words should have so shaken him. Looking at Dorothy. Well, I can understand it. To Daniel, after a pause. Master Deuce, I am an old man now, and a, a very grave and sober old man, too. I had a fair young wife once. She had eyes like thy daughter's eyes. There's a strange whim in my head, but I'm an old man, and... 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 Uh, may I kiss thy little daughter? Daniel, much moved. Aye, aye. Thou... thou mayst kiss her, if thou wilt. Dorothy goes up to Sir Jasper, who kisses her on the forehead. God bless thee, maiden. Donald Deuce, I thank thee. Exit Sir Jasper. Oh, father, didst thou hear? I am to go to the hall. I have heard that it is a goodly place, as big as a village, and bravely decked with velvets and rich silks and pictures and vast mirrors. Oh, I long to see the mirrors. 
Then the gardens are beyond everything fair to view, and there are deer in the park and a spacious lake, and carriages and horses too. Oh, it must be brave to live in so fair a place. Daniel, in a broken voice. Why, Dorothy, these things are but vanities. Oh, Dorothy, my darling, be content with thy lot. Nay, father, but indeed I envy not Sir Jasper. I grieve to think how solitary the poor gentleman must be, all alone in so vast a house, with neither wife nor child to solace him in his old age. Did he tell thee of his child? I, speaking gravely, yet kindly, as of a sorrow still unhealed. But when he told me how he lost the maiden many years ago, and how he has vainly sought her ever since, my heart yearned to him, for the tears glistened in his eyes. Methinks a daughter must needs love such a father, for he is a noble gentleman. Nay, thou knowest him not. He did not deal rightly by the girl. He left her to perish, to perish, Dolly, that he might save his own life. He is rightly served. The sins of his youth are visited upon him in his old age. It is just, it is just. I would not have quitted thee, my child, my child. In truth, I am very sure of that. I cannot think there is in this world peril or necessity so dire as to part us twain. Thou never leave me, Dolly. Never. Come what may. Come what may. He kisses her. Exit Dorothy. Daniel, looking after her. Oh, it's hard, Arthur, so long, for the heart of my body is not so dear to me as yon poor little girl. Oh, Dolly, it cannot be right, it cannot be right. Thou hast taken to me as a father. If thou wast my own flesh and blood, thou couldst not be dearer to me, nor I to thee. And now, Arthur, so long, it cannot be right. Enter Geoffrey. Why, Master Druce, thou hast tears in thine eyes. Ay, lad, and cause for em in my heart. Geoffrey, there's a heavy blow come on me. I, I told thee of the cruel, thankless father who left my girl with me, my Dorothy, thy Dorothy. Yes. I, I have seen him, Geoffrey. Here, here, I have seen him. Him as thou art here to meet. That's Dolly's father. Sir Jasper, impossible. Yes, I tell thee, twas him. He didn't know me, but I knowed him. Geoffrey, my only hope lies with thee. Thou must wed Dorothy, I at once too. He cannot take her from thee, and we will all go hence to a place of safety. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Geoffrey, after a pause. Master Drews. Thou art a tender-hearted, right-doing man, and it's not for a boy like me to shape thy course. Why, what dost thou mean? If this man, Sir Jasper Combe, is indeed her father. Her father? He cast her from him. He left her to perish. Her father? Heaven had given him the richest treasure that heaven can give, and he flung it into my lap as he'd fling a coin to a beggar. The trust that he forsook, I took up. The child that he plucked from his bosom, I took to mine. There let it bide, Geoffrey Winyard, there let it bide. Yet bethink thee, the poor lone gentleman hath paid a bitter price for his wickedness, and though he did a cruel and reckless thing in abandoning her, Yet grief and penitence have wrought a great change in him, and the laws of heaven and of man give him a right over her that none may gainsay. And have I earned no right in these fourteen years? Why, think what she is to me, what we are to each other. She has vouchsafed me her love, and for it I kneel down and worship her. She has turned my heart to man, and for it I kneel down and worship her. She has shown me the truth, and for it I kneel down and worship her. We are life and death, body and soul, 
all in all to each other. And now thou wouldst have me say to this unworthy man, Here is the daughter thou didst abandon in thy peril. For fourteen years I have rid her as mine own, but as thou didst beget her, so take her. I did but hold her in trust for thee, that thou mightst reclaim her when it seemed good to thee to do so. It might be that this is my duty, Geoffrey Winyard, but I cannot do it. I cannot do it. Thy case is a hard one. It is not for me to judge. Thou hast rightly said it is not for thee to judge. Moreover, bethink thee thou lovedst her. If this man, her father, reclaims her, he will take her from thee and raise her to a station as far above thine as thine is above hers. Art thou so sure that Sir Jasper is indeed her father? That's true, that's very true. I know not that he is her father. I cannot tell that. We judge men by their deeds, Geoffrey, not their words, and he may have lied. Come. That's well thought of, Geoffrey, but we'll go hence, Dolly and I. No one shall know. Thou shalt join us later, and when thou and she are married, and he cannot take her from thee, why, then, maybe we'll... Oh, Geoffrey, thou wilt not betray me, thou wilt not betray her. Promise me that. I promise. Daniel turns. Remember, Geoffrey... Thou'st promised. Exit. In truth, I am in a sore strait. For Sir Jasper is a man of proud blood, who would laugh to scorn such humble love as mine. And, oh, Dorothy, if thou art taken from me, why, my life may go too. And if I cannot yield thee up, how can I ask him to do so? Oh, Daniel Drews, Daniel Druce, my heart is with thine in this thing, and I'll keep thy secret, never fear. Enter Reuben. Why, whom have we here in Dorothy's house? A whelp, a very whelp, cur or puppy, to be beckoned to, whistled to, frowned at, scowled at, whipped with whips, beaten with sticks and slapped with the flat of the hand. Your servant, sir, who are you? Why, sir, I am an old horse soldier, and yet not so very old neither, but that I can wield a quarter-staff, or give the Cornish fling as well as another. No mere trooper neither, but a sergeant of horse, if you please and one that hath cut his way through war's intestine as a hot knife cuts butter, one who has so snicked, chipped, chopped, slashed, cut, drilled, and carbonated with sword, with pistolet, with mace, with arquebus, with petronel, and with what not, that he'd make no more of passing a rapier through that boy's body of thine than of spitting a penny herring. And now, sir, who are you? Why, sir, I am a sailor, and I hate a brag. Come, come, civil words, young master, lest we quarrel. And when I quarrel, sextons lay in tolling grease and grave diggers strip to their work. Dost thou know this Daniel Druce? I do. A comfortable old man, as they tell me and one who can portion his pretty Dorothy. Pretty Dorothy and I are very good friends. She listens when I talk, which many won't. Geoffrey makes an angry gesture. And talking of pretty Dorothy, we have here a bauble or locket, or, as one may say, a trinket that belongeth to her. I'll go bail. Picking up locket, which Geoffrey dropped. Sir, that locket is mine. It is very like, it is very like, yet for that I have but thy word. I care for no man's word, now nah, not even for mine own, for though it is as good as another's, yet it is worth nothing. If this trinket be thine, 
describe it with circumstance and i will give it up to thee enter daniel unperceived he listens in great agitation it is fashioned like a heart and bears an inscription to the best loved of all and it is dated seventeen years since it is a love taken sir and i desire you to yield it up without further parley reuben who has recognized it why surely i should know this trinket well from whom did you receive it geoffrey taking it from him that is a question that i have no will to answer it is a token of betrothal let that suffice but that don't suffice do you know who i am i am bailiff to sir jasper combe sir jasper combe ay and i recognise that locket as one that he placed about the neck of his missing daughter the very day he abandoned her come sir from whom did you receive it it is a love token a token of betrothal to whom are you betrothed geoffrey much agitated i decline to say enter dorothy at back Daniel stops her and motions her to be silent. They both listen together. Shall I hazard a conjecture or guess? Thou art here making free in the blacksmith's forge. The blacksmith hath a daughter. Her name is Dorothy. Shall we say that it is to Dorothy that thou art betrothed? Geoffrey, with an effort to speak unconcernedly, what dorothy druce no no master bailiff not dorothy druce dorothy expresses surprise and pain and yet i noticed that when i spoke lightly of her thou didst start in anger and flush up in a fashion ridiculous to behold i have the eye of a hawk geoffrey confused oh uh, for that if it is true that i have laughed and jested with dorothy but you know we sailors have a special license for such love frolics we mean nothing by them it is said of us that we have a wife in every port well that's a slander but at least i'll plead guilty to a sweetheart in every village dorothy weeps on daniel's bosom huh thou art a shameless young reprobate by thy own showing it will go hard but sir jasper will elicit the truth we shall meet again exit reuben daniel and dorothy come forward daniel trembling with rage dorothy weeping so geoffrey winyard the blow that is to bring me to my grave has been dealt by thine hand the secret which was thine and mine has been revealed by thee o oh, thief of more than heart and gold o oh, slayer of more than human life are there no laws to fit such crime as thine father father heard him not master Drews, indeed i i knew not thou knewest not will there be more mercy in this man's heart because thou knewest not will the last years of my poor old lonely life be less desolate because thou knewest not oh father father what sayest thou nay girl stop me not taking up a hammer geoffrey winyard there are injuries that laws can measure and laws are made for em there are injuries that no laws can measure and we em we deal ourselves and wreak our vengeance we our own right hands to dorothy who interposes stand aside girl i'm a weak old man but there's devil enough in me to deal with such as him dorothy kneeling holds his arm no no father yield not to thy wrath he hath denied me he hath dealt lightly with my love and there's an end oh harm him not harm him not pardon him even as i pardon him and let him depart in peace daniel with a violent effort to be calm ay ay thou recallest me to myself he hath dealt lightly with thy love 
and there's an end. Heed not the words I spake, they were empty words and had no meaning. Heed them not. Geoffrey Winyard, thou hast spoken lightly of my child, thou hast denied her who gave thee her heart. It was ill done. Quit my roof and let me see thee no more. I, I pardon thee. Go. Master Drews, have pity, for my tongue is tied. I, I, I may not speak. Go. Dorothy, one word. Hear what I have to say. Dorothy, with an effort. Geoffrey, thou hast denied me. I love thee, but thou must go. Geoffrey goes out sadly. When he has gone, Dorothy falls sobbing at Daniel's feet. My child, my child. Music. End of Act Two. Act Three of Daniel Drew's Blacksmith by W. S. Gilbert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three. Scene. Interior of Drew's cottage. Time. Evening. Dorothy is discovered, pale and weak, sitting by the fire, reading an old and tattered letter, her head resting in her hand. Daniel discovered at back. He has a bundle and stick in his hand, as if prepared for a journey. He is pale and anxious. Haven tied, and he's not yet come to claim her. It's weary waiting for a blow that is to fall, and will wait no longer. It's hard to have to creep away from the old forge like a thief in the night and begin the weary struggle anew, God knows where. But that it should have come through him who I loved like a son and whom I'd have taken to my heart as a son, it's doubly hard it should have come through him. Looking at Dorothy. Poor maiden. She thinks him false to her. Well, it's better so. I'll keep that thought alive. It will account for much that I may not explain. One word would lift that sorrow from her gentle heart, but it must not be spoke. Not yet. Not yet. Aloud. What art thou reading, lass? It is the letter he wrote to me from Morocco, two years since. I am bidding farewell to it ere I destroy it, for he is betrothed to another and I may not keep it now. He spake to me in jest. Oh, Father, it's hard to bear. Aye, aye, hard to bear. Dolly, hard to bear. And to vaunt his unfaithfulness in the ears of a very stranger. It was a cruel boast, for I loved him with all my heart. Better learn the truth now than later, as I did, as I did. Early fall, light fall, Dolly. When my sorrow come, it had like to ha crushed the life out of me. But thou art young, my child, and time will heal thy wound. If he had but known how I loved him. But in truth, I knew it not myself. It is hard to bear, for he had truth in his face, and I doubted nothing. Trust no faces, Dolly. They lie. They lie. Nay, but it is not like thee to say these bitter things. More like me than thou wottest of, Dolly. I have told thee what I was afore thou camest to me. The past fourteen years are gone like a dream, and I am waking up from it, Dolly. I am waking from it. Takes up his bundle. Why, father, art thou going away? Aye, lass, we are both going away. Dorothy is surprised. Tonight. Tonight. Make thy bundle, for time presses. But whither are we going? Whither? What odds whither, so that we leave this place? Out into the cold world. It matters little where. Thou'lt fret here. It's better to take thee hence for a time, only for a time. Get thy bundle quickly. Take all thou hast. I'll tell thee more and on. We've no time to lose. Dorothy going. As thou wilt, father. Aside. Tonight, oh, Geoffrey, Geoffrey, this is indeed the end. Exit. 
Poor child, poor child. My heart smites me for deceiving her, for harmful as he's been to me, he never had thought for aught but her. I'm almost sorry I was so rough with him. He did not know. But the harm's done, and there's no undoing it. So, old Forge, the time has come when thou and I must part forever. May he who comes ar to me have as good cause to love thee as I have, for I have been o'er happy here. <laughs> Reuben has entered and overheard the last few lines. What? Daniel Druce on the eve of a journey? Nay, thou take no journey to-night, I promise thee. Unstrap thy pack and burn thy staff. For thou eat here, drink here, sleep here, make money here, lose money here, laugh with joy, frown with anger, groan with pain, mope here, sicken here, dwindle here, and die here. Take an old warrior's word for it. Reuben Haynes, art thou here to take her from me? No, Master Daniel, I am not here to take her from thee. And yet, in a sense, yes, Master Daniel, I am here to take her from thee. Weigh these words well, and store them away in the museum of thy mind, for they are rare words containing as they do truth commingled with wisdom which is an observable union as these qualities consort but rarely together for he hath no wisdom who tells the plain truth and he hath no need to tell the plain truth who hath wisdom enough to do without it it's a paradox daniel impatiently to the devil with thy chop logic. I cannot wait for it. Speak out, and let me know the best and the worst. Does, does thy master know? He does not know as yet. And why does he not know? Because the mighty should be merciful, and I have refrained. If thou art not mocking at my sorrow, speak plainly. Then observe i am a potent magician or if thou preferest it a benevolent fairy who hath certain gifts to dispose of on the one hand i have family union domestic happiness and snug old age on the other blank misery abject despair and desolation utter and complete which shall I give to Sir Jasper, and which to thee? Now I am a pleasant old gentleman, well to do, not so very old neither, yet old enough to marry. Dorothy and I are good friends. She listens to me when I talk, which many won't. It is a good sign and augurs well, for I love a good listener. How say you? Come, give me thy daughter, and I will give thee Sir Jasper's daughter. Aside. Aha! It is neatly put. It is a quip. Give thee my Dorothy? With an effort to be calm. No, no, it cannot be. She is promised. True, I drove him forth, but she still loves him. No, no. I cannot do that. I cannot do that. Reflect. Sir Jasper will take her from thee for ever. Thou wilt never behold her again. He will drive thee from thy forge, and thou wilt be a desolate old vagabond, while she is learning day by day to forget thee, and to give her love to another. Thou refusest? It is well done, brave old man. Thou shrinkest not from the troubles that environ thee, though they threaten to crush thee utterly. And so I say, brave old man. 
going. Nay, stay one moment. Give me time to think. How am I to do this thing? And yet, I will consent. That is, if Dorothy will. I will ask her. Nay, I will persuade her. God forgive me. Enter Dorothy. Dorothy, my child, come hither. I have somewhat to say to thee. I, I am not long for this world. And when I am gone... Oh, Dorothy, bear with what I have to say. This man, this Reuben Haynes, he loveth thee, and would make thee his wife. Oh, father! Ay, I know what thou wouldst say. Thou lovest Geoffrey, but bear in mind he loves thee not. He spake slightingly of thee, he did deny thee, he loveth other woman. Thou didst hear him say as much. See, this man will love thee better than Geoffrey. He, he is not a young man, he is of sober age, and a man of good substance. O oh, Dorothy, my child, have pity on me. I cannot answer, I am lost in wonder. Dorothy, my little girl, for a reason which I cannot tell thee, it concerns my life, I, my life, that thou shouldst take this man. I, I, I have been a kind father to thee, have I not? I have asked naught of thee till now. O oh, my child, it is for thine happiness as well as for mine, if thou didst but know, if thou didst but know. Behold, maiden, I am worth consideration. I am not as many other old men are. In all but years I am a boy, a very boy. My father, I know not of the sorrow that hangs over thee, but it must needs be heavy if thou canst suffer this man to say this thing to me. Dorothy, have patience. If to yield up my life would serve thee, I would yield it ten times told. The time may soon come when I shall prove thee this, for I cannot live alone. Father, I know not of this man but what is ill. Nevertheless, as thou hast been to me as my father, and I to thee as thy child, bound in all lawful things to obey thee, so will I obey thee, even in this. To Reuben. Sir, I cannot love you, for my heart is given. But if my father bids me, I must needs to do his bidding. Kneels. O oh, my father, if the breaking of my heart can save thee, it is thine to break. It is dutifully spoken. It is a bargain. Give me thine hand on it, Daniel Druce. Set thine heart at rest. It is settled. Daniel, furiously. Aye, it is settled. Get thee hence now and forever, and do thy worst. Dorothy, forgive me. Twas but for a moment I wavered. I am strong now. To Reuben. Thou hast a master. Thou owest him a duty. Go do it. I'll do mine. We will wait here, she and I, and when the blow comes, we'll bear it together. Daniel Druce, I warn thee. And I warn thee, Reuben Haynes, quit my roof, and that quickly, if thou settest value on thy blood, for it's ill trifling we may now. As yet, I'm master here. T'won't be for long, but while I'm here, I'll be obeyed. Get thee hence. Take thy damned face out, I tell ee, lest I do that which none can undo. Go! Do thy worst. Brave old man, thou defiest me to my very face, and I honour thee for it. There is sore tribulation in store for thee, likewise much bitter wailing and anguish without end. Yet thou shrinkest not. It is well done, and damn me, I honour thee for it. Brave old man. Exit Reuben. Father, thou wast wont to tell me of thy sorrow. Hide not from me the source of this bitter grief. Am I not in all things thy daughter? And who should comfort thee if I may not? My child, I have naught to hide from thee now. 
the reed on which a lent is broken, and... Knock. Daniel starts in terror. Who's there? Geoffrey without. Master Drews. It is Geoffrey. He had best not see thee. Get thee hence. I'll open to him. Father, deal gently with him, for the love I bear him. Exit Dorothy. Daniel opens the door. Enter Geoffrey. Master Daniel, I'm going to see. I have written to refuse the post that Sir Jasper would have given me, and I am going tonight. I come to pray your pardon for the sorrow I have brought upon your home. Give me that before I go. I, I pardon thee, my lad. Thou didst not know. Heaven prosper thee. Is that all? I have something to ask about. About Mistress Dorothy. Too late. She's not mine to give. Her father, he's coming for her to take her from me. Oh, Geoffrey, he's coming to take her from me. And I'm waiting here for the blow to fall. I'm waiting here for my death. I did not come to seek her love. I know that that is gone from me forever. Master Daniel, she heard me deny her, and she believes that I spake in earnest. I'm going from her now, forever. There's no chance that she'll ever see me again. I think I should go with a lighter heart if I knew that when I'm gone, and there's many a mile of stormy water betwixt us, some one would tell her that I'm not so bad and cruel and heartless as she thinks me. If some one would tell her that, it was for her sake that I denied her. For her sake and for thine. I think I could go with a lighter heart if I knew she would be sure to think rightly of me in the end. That's all I've got to say. My lad, I've dealt hardly with thee, but I was sorely put about, and not rightly master of myself. If it lay with me, I'd give my girl to thee with a light heart, but my poor lad, it don't lay with me now. He's coming for to take her from me. Knock. At last, at last, Sir Jasper is here. Get thee within there. Pointing to inner room. I have business with this man. Exit Geoffrey into room as Daniel opens door and admits Sir Jasper and Reuben. So, Donald Truce, thou art the man who for fourteen long years has hidden my daughter away from me. Sir, I am indeed he. Oh, shame upon thee, shame upon thee. I crave your mercy, for I knew not her father's name till today. Yet it would seem that having learnt it, thou wouldst nevertheless have fled with her, had not this good fellow arrested thy flight. I have naught to say that your honour's kind heart will not more fitly say for me. We love one another dearly. Truly, in the bitterness of my grief, I had thought to flee with her. But my better self prevailed, and I stayed. Credit him not, sir, for he lieth. He was in the very nick of departure when I interposed, and with stern upbraiding, withering invective, and threat of instant death, did bid him await your honour's commands. The palsied coward trembled and obeyed. Nay, nice, sir. This man, this traitorous man, offered to keep the matter from you forever, if I would consent to give him the child to wife. She will herself bear witness to this. Jasper to Reuben. Art thou indeed guilty of this treachery? Why, sir, there is a measure of truth even in this fellow's speech, inasmuch as I did indeed say it. But... Herein lurks the humour of the thing. I did it but to try him. It was, as it were, a subtle essay or delicate test, prepared and carried out to the life with much ingenuity, in pursuit of the grandest of all studies, the conduct of a man under the influence of extraordinary temptation. I am a philosopher. Thy philosophy shall be severely tried. 
Deliver thy books and papers to Master Geoffrey Wynyard, who I appoint steward in thy place. Thy stewardship is at an end. Be gone. But, sir, consider... Be gone, I say, and let me see thee no more. Reuben at door. I am a philosopher. Be gone. Exit Reuben dolefully. Now, Donald Druce. If thou hast aught to say in defence of thy conduct, I am prepared to hear it. Aught to say? No, sir, I've naught to say worth saying. Thou'st seen the maiden, thou'st seen how fair she is, how good she is, how pure and gentle and tender and true she is. That says more for me than I could say for myself. She softened my stubborn heart, she made me a man, I have learnt to look on her as my daughter, she on me as her father. We've been all in all to each other, and at the thought of losing of her, my poor old heart's most broken in twain. I don't know as I've any more for to say. No, sir, that's all. Sighing. I am sorry for you, but you have brought this grief upon yourself. You have been guilty of gross injustice both to myself and to the girl. What? Knowing as you did that inquiries would certainly be made for the child, you nevertheless stole away from the town and left no clue whatsoever as to your destination. Knowing as I did, how did I know? What was there for her to tell me? Was it the love that her father showed for her when he left her to perish on that stormy Norfolk coast? Did that reckless profligate set such value on his treasure as to make it so sure he would ever come for it again? Why, he set his life afore hers. That he might live, he left her to die. Why, she was well quit of such a father. Take her from me, Jasper Coombe, if thou'st the heart to do it. But do it with a shut mouth. For God knows, with all my sins, and there are many, I have done my duty by her. Donald, I spoke harshly. I am sorry for it. You are right, that she was not my own child. But a stepchild matters nothing. I loved her mother dearly. It was my duty to protect the child, and I basely forsook my trust. But for this misdeed I have suffered bitterly. It killed her poor mother, who loved her beyond measure, and on her deathbed I swore to search out the child that I might make amends, and now that after many years of weary searching I have found her, shall I yield her up, even to you? Come, Tarnal, be just, and ask yourself this. I have now to say it again, sir. It's right, but it's so hard. It's so hard. Dorothy, my child! Come hither. Enter Dorothy. Daniel to Sir Jasper. I ask your pardon, sir, if I did call her my child, still, for she's been more than that to me. To Dorothy. Dolly, my lass, there's a change in star for thee, a grand change. Thou'rt a lady, ay, a great lady too. I allers knowed thou wast a lady. To Sir Jasper. She don't talk like us common folks, sir. To Dorothy. This gentleman, Sir Jasper Coombe, he's come to claim thee. He's thy father, Dolly. Think of that. And he's he's going to take thee from me. Only to Coombe Raven, Dolly, where I come and see thee often. To Sir Jasper. Thou let me come and see her odd times. To Dorothy. And thou come and see me, and there'll be grand doings then, eh, hey, Dolly? There, there, go with thy father. He'll be a kind father to thee, and he'll love thee well, never doubt it. And, and I shall love thee too, and thou shalt have two fathers instead of one, Dolly. That's all. She is about to speak. Don't speak, don't speak, for God's sake, don't speak. He rushes out. Dorothy stands dumb with surprise. Dorothy, my child, I am indeed he who should stand to thee in the place of a father. I know that I seem to thee to be doing a hard thing, 
for thou hast learnt to love him, and he hath earned thy love. But Dorothy, I am childless and alone, wealthy, honoured, and of, of good repute, yet alone in my old age. Dorothy, uh, come to me, come to me. Dorothy, who has been sobbing through this speech. Oh, sir, forgive me if I seem to speak thoughtlessly, for I am but a poor untaught girl, and I know not how to reply. He has been so good to me, and I love him with all the love of my heart. Oh, sir, it cannot be that after these long years of tender love I am to be taken from him now. Oh, it will kill him. Have pity on him, sir, for it will kill him. I cannot leave him now. I am the very light of his eyes, the very heart of his life. Sobbing. I cannot leave him now. Oh, sir, if thou hast no care for him, yet for the love of my mother, have pity upon me. Jasper, after a pause. Uh, I had thought my atonement was as an end, but my bitterest punishment is yet to come, and I am to suffer at thy hands. So be it, it is just. A Dorothy, my child, whom I have sought so long, I will not break another heart. Thou art free to go to him who has been more to thee than many fathers. Heaven bless thee for those good words. They have sown seed in my heart that will bear thee truer love than could have come in many years passed away from him. Sir, thou hast spared his life. When his wife left him, it drove him to the very verge of madness, and this last blow would have ended his life. Did his wife leave him? Alas, yes, many years since, before I was sent to him. And he loved her very dearly, too? So dearly that he would have taken her to his heart if she had returned to him, so dearly that he called me Dorothy because he read her name in mine eyes. Dorothy? Or was that her name? I, Dorothy Marple, for that is rightly my father's name. But to save her good fame, he gave out that he was dead, and he took the name he now bears. Jasper, aside. My sin has borne bitter fruit. Uh, Donald Juice, give me thy pardon. Dorothy, for the sake of the Dorothy who is dead, give me thy pardon. Enter Daniel Juice. Master Juice, heaven has interposed to save me from unwittingly working on thee a deep and bitter injury. Take the child that is thine own in the eye of God and of man. As she has been thy daughter hitherto, so shall she be thy daughter to the end. Why, sir, Dorothy, my child, is he not going to take thee from me? I have no right with her. She is thine, uh, to bless thine old age and to, to bring thee comfort to the very last. Dorothy, my child, my child. Takes Dorothy in his arms. Oh, sir, I know not how to bless thee for this blessing. Give me no blessing. I have done thee a wrong that is beyond the power of a man to repair. Think of the think of the deepest injury that man's wickedness has ever wrought on thee, and place it to my account. Daniel thunderstruck. If it lies within thee to extend the hand of pardon to him who laid waste thine home and made thy life desolate, read in my blighted life the punishment that the sin of my youth has brought upon me in my old age. As I have sinned, so before heaven, I have atoned. Exit Sir Jasper. Daniel, as Sir Jasper's meaning breaks upon him. Stay, come back. If this be not a devil-born dream, come back and hear me out. Oh, source of all the sorrow I have known. Oh, black and bitter curse of two poor lives. Thy life for hers. Thy cursed life for hers. Father, spare him. Be merciful. Be just. He is an old man now. Thou art an old man. 
Is it in the winter of your lives that the heart-burnings of hot youth are to be avenged? He has wronged thee, but he has suffered and will yet suffer. As I have prevailed to turn thee to mankind, so let me, thy daughter, thy daughter indeed, thy own flesh, her own flesh, prevail against this one surviving sorrow. Spare him and pardon him for her sake and for mine. Niels. Enter Geoffrey. O oh, Dorothy, dead and in heaven, when God took thee, he left an angel behind to plead for thee and for this man. It is heaven's voice. My anger has gone out of me. Dorothy, wilt thou believe now that it was for thy sake and for thy father's that I did deceive thee? Dorothy rises. Daniel sits. Wilt thou believe now that I love thee truly and beyond all on earth? Oh, Geoffrey, forgive me. Forgive me. I acted in haste. I knew not what I did. Embracing him. My darling. Kisses her. Art thou happy, Geoffrey? Passing happy. And thou? Passing happy. End of Act Three End of Daniel Drew's Blacksmith by W. S. Gilbert